June. Um, before we start, can I welcome new members to the committee? Uh, we've had a full council since the last Corporate Through Committee meeting, so we've got some new members. Uh, this is my first meeting in the chair. Can I thank the outgoing chair, Councillor Quigley? It was a great surprise to me that he nominated me to replace him. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, I'd also like to note that um, Councillor Cameron Palin has resigned as the IWALK uh, representative on this committee, and I believe they are in the process of nominating a new representative who hopefully will be here by the next meeting. Um, I have also been given notice, I think it's called a, a Regulation 10 notice. Um, it's delegated uh, authority to seek bids for the disposal of Yarmouth Primary School, or the old site. Um, I've been informed as Chair of Corporate Scrutiny. I don't think we have jurisdiction to uh, disagree with that, but uh, I'm giving notice through the Chair. So bids will be sought. Uh, in a in a reasonably urgent manner, I think, to dispose of that site. Um, apologies, I've got apologies from Peter Spink, who's now the vice chair of this committee, uh, and Councillor Dave Adams is substituting in his place. Uh, item two, minutes. Uh, we've got uh, draft minutes in front of us. Um, before I sign, can I seek um, a proposal that they be approved? Uh, Councillor Quirk and a seconder, Councillor Quigley. All those in favour? Uh, any abstentions? And anyone against? No, so two abstentions there. Fine, thank you. Thank you. Uh, item three, declarations of interest. Are there any? Councillor Ellis. Thank you. Uh, with regards to agenda item nine, I'm uh, associate governor of Chilton and Rookley and Godsell Primary Schools. Thank you. Any others? No. OK. Uh, item four, public question time. So I've got a number of written questions here, 17 of them. Uh, are there any oral questions from the gallery? Yeah, please. please. Come forward and switch the mic on when it's red. It's going. Thank you. Yeah. If you could let us have your name. Thanks. Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Sam Picard. Um, and I'm questioning, uh, well, I wanted to understand more basically about the decision or the proposal to close the four primary schools, which was then subsequently reversed uh, in the same week. Uh, my interest is, of course, I have two children at one of the schools and I have a wife who also works at one of the schools. I don't know if I'm addressing the, the right people, but I felt it was prudent to come along to this uh, to this um, discussion to ask my questions. I think as you will understand, probably. Such an announcement, you know, creates a lot of anxiety and stress among the, the pupils, the teachers uh, and the parents. Um, and I wanted to try to understand it also creates a lot of doubt about the, the school and the long term viability of the school. So I think one thing I want to understand is where are we in the process? And is it typical to have what seems to be a very firm proposal made only to appear to be reversed within the same week? And the timing, of course, being the day before half term when many are looking forward to a restful time. So I just wanted to get more clarity on that and also the ongoing risk uh, to these schools, whether or not there is still a, a hangover on them and basically more clarity and visibility on the process. So again, I don't know if it's the right audience, but that's the questions I would like to pose. Um, thank you. Uh, I mean, Councillor Andre is welcome to speak. It's still on the uh, agenda anyway, that item. Um, I'm going to bring it up from item nine to item seven, so it'll be the first substantive issue. I don't know whether you want to leave it till then, Councillor Andre, whether you'd like to respond briefly now and in more detail at that item. I will defer to you, Chair, but I think there may well be further questions yeah. coming from members of this committee, so it yeah. might be more apropos to actually answer them yeah. because my answers may answer yeah. 
more than one question. So, so I'm confident your very good questions will be questions we've all got members of this committee. So we'll deal with it at um, agenda item now seven, okay. uh, which which won't be long, uh, probably in the next five minutes. We'll start that. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you. Um, and I've got, as I say, 17 written questions, which I think all relate to the same subject. Um, there is a written response that those questioners will get from the Director of Children's Services. Um, I don't intend to read it out, but it obviously states that the proposal is being withdrawn. Um, I think it would be good to circulate it to Corporate Scrutiny Committee if we haven't done so already. So you'll get that on email. And of course, every, every person who's written in will get that as a formal uh, written response. Um, there are no other public questions. Uh, item five, progress update, uh, to receive an update on the progress against outcomes. Um, I've just got a couple of things. So at the last corporate scrutiny, we talked about uh, flooding and Southern Water and the council um, getting on with the outcomes from the flood investigations and rolling out the water butt scheme with more urgency. Um, James Brewer has kindly offered to arrange that as an informal meeting. So uh, I suspect possibly sometime in July there will be notice of an informal scrutiny meeting for that, where we'll have Southern Water, the Environment Agency, and of course council officers in the room, um, and we can try and uh, get some more detailed update on what those agencies and the council are doing. Um, second item is floating bridge was on the agenda back in February and my predecessor as chair did write to the cabinet to ask for a uh, selected disclosure of the um, uh, agreement that was reached over the floating bridge we haven't had a response from cabinet on that and it's now some uh, three months old uh, I wonder if someone could take that back to cabinet and, and finally get an answer whether the cabinet are going to allow chair of scrutiny and uh, I think it was two further named people to have to be able to look at that document. Uh, okay, I will. Well, I nominate you, Councillor Stevens. You are the uh, deputy leader of the council. We asked the cabinet to finally make a decision on that because the written request was made in March. Well, I believe there was a response because uh, obviously part, part of the agreement is uh, subject to. Uh, uh, non-disclosure and uh, that won't change but what I will do is I'll take I'll take your concerns back to uh, informal cabinet discuss it and come back to you as chair of uh, uh, the uh, corporate scrutiny committee and uh, give you the answer at that time thank you councillor Stevens it was actually a formal written request by the chair of this committee back at the beginning of March following the February meeting so we'd like a formal answer but thank you I'll I'll I'll, I'll uh, communicate with you afterwards thank you you'll have a formal response okay. councillor love yeah yes to, I, I just want to reiterate three months is not acceptable and a written response is a written response. It should be at the earliest opportunity and not at the latest opportunity. So and that information now delays this committee in making any uh, deliberations on that for a further period of time. That's why it's important to have a, a, a written responses in a timely way. Thank you. Councillor Quirk. Um, I don't want to put uh, words into Councillor Quigley's mouth, but uh, the item on calling, um, the response, I don't think, is a response to the question that was asked. Uh, the question that was asked actually, I think, related to being aware of the delegated decisions that were being made, not training us as to how to handle them and to make a call in. Uh, I think it's good that we have training for the call in, but I don't think it addresses the question. Um, maybe, maybe we should like to add something to that. Yeah, I think it was more around the process of knowing what had been called in so that we could actually say, see, view what's been called in and then work out whether we need to do something about it and actually monitor how much was being called in because I know we'd had a report saying not a lot. So are you proposing something there, Councillor Quirk? Uh, I just think we should actually have a response that relates to how we inform councillors of the um, officer delegated decisions that are being made because at present we don't know about them yeah fine okay 
item six uh, committee work plan, so the forward plan and the committee's work program, pages 13. Uh, I had a look at this and uh, for myself, I'm happy with what is on the uh, forward plan. Uh, well, what's on the forward plan and then what's on our work program. Is there anything that anyone would like to add or think should be added? Councillor Drew. Thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate it. It may not necessarily be entirely within the remit of this scrutiny committee, but I wanted to propose potentially subject to perhaps a wider debate about establishing a task force um, to look at affordable housing on the island. I think everybody here is absolutely in agreement that we need to move forwards with that. I've been having some informal conversations with Councillor Stevens and, and Councillor Fuller. And I wondered whether this may be um, the forum at which we could establish a task committee by which we could have potentially senior members, officers, um, as well as external stakeholders, such as the chair of the housing associations, so that we could potentially work through some of the roadblocks which have been um, put out into the public domain with regards to affordable housing. And I, I think for myself, I would certainly welcome the opportunity to be able to ask some of those questions on discrete areas. So for example, you know, when we've had responses about the ability for us to borrow, you know, looking at the mechanics of how that works, when there are issues about perhaps the, um, the relinquishment of public lands so that we can look at how that might work and, and sort of basically go blow by blow at each roadblock. Um, so I, I don't know if there's a particular form um, that we could take, perhaps democratic services might be able to advise, um, but that, that would be my, my hope and my proposal. Um, housing does fall under neighbourhoods and regeneration scrutiny. Um, so it may be worth having a conversation with Councillor Stewart about that as the chairman. Yes, yeah, so what I would suggest is uh, we have that conversation. If there is any remit or possibility to deal with it through corporate scrutiny to bring it through as an agenda item for July, there may not be. But if there is to bring it through as an agenda item to discuss the possibility of setting up a task force, I think there's enough room on the July agenda, but it may be that that's simply not possible. Yeah. Councillor Quigley. Uh, I commend what Councillor Drew's saying, but I don't think we need to complicate it through a committee because we don't. I don't think we meet often enough. I think maybe a request to work cross party because I know Councillor Stevens is doing something already that we just corporate scrutiny asks that a formal a formal group is put together to look at it because waiting between committee meetings I think it's a bit too long to do what you're suggesting, and I think it is important. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think what my hope would be is that to some extent this could be in public because I think this certainly is something that, that obviously all, all members of the island community are very much interested in and would welcome that chance to scrutinise it themselves. So I think, yeah, perhaps for that further discussion. OK, well, let's have further discussion. And if there's something to put on the agenda, I, agenda even to uh, note what those discussions have led to or that somebody else is taking it forward, we can do that uh, at, at the least. Um, Chief Executive. Thank you, Chair. I, I, I just I think I would I would ask that if we're going to have a further discussion that we set out what the hypothesis is that we're going to be testing. So what the exam question is that we're going to be asking, because I thought if we just say we want a task force or a discussion about affordable housing, that's a very, very broad subject. So something that defines the actual scope of what we want to look at, I think would be really useful as well. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Quigley is right. The door is open. Use it. Um, what I'm concerned about is the workload on our officer corps. I'm happy to uh, meet on some of the some of the information that comes up at uh, at the meetings at this moment in time are the delicate situation, and therefore sometimes the uh, presence of the public and other, biz, uh, other business um, uh, stakeholders is sometimes a little bit too delicate. And we really, if we're, if we're going to do this and you want, to, you want to have input, and so you should, and if you'd approach me outside of this meeting, we wouldn't, have, we, we wouldn't be having this discussion at this time because we've already got um, 
two, two, of you, two members of your group involved. And as far as I'm concerned, there's room for more. There is room for more. But what we need to do is work uh, together in trust to, to create positive outcomes for the, for the people in need. And I think that's, that's the, that, those are the drivers. Um, but let's not overburden uh, Isle of Wight Council staff. If we, can, if we can continue within the lines that we've already got, that's great. But I'm welcoming, welcoming any discussion outside the meeting with anyone. And that's anyone across the chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Uh, just referring to something, comment Wendy made. I think if the task force is set up, I think we need to make a real distinction between affordable homes and social rented homes. I think that's very, very important because to me, there's no affordable homes. I think the market purely dictates that whether the, the government says 20% or 30% discount, I think that's completely skewed with to anyone's affordability on the island. And I think from the start, getting back to what you were saying with the task force, Brian, I think we need to try and work on social rent levels, whereas we can get people most in need out of the B&B accommodation and then whatever, wherever they are, get the most needed into these socially rented homes. Thank you, Chair. I think um, uh, open door just sounds a little bit too woolly for me. I think what we've reached a point now where an incredible amount of work has gone on. And I think actually by working together across all parties in a formalised way would be a much better approach, in my opinion, at this point, because, because there's no doubt about it. We are not able for various different reasons to deliver in the way that we thought we might be able to originally. And so therefore, I think um, a fresh look, a fresh start working together, open door, meeting together, fine, but let's have it a bit more formalised. And so I would agree with, with uh, that. But I do think you're absolutely right. You, we need to define what we mean, what, what is the, the outcome that we want and what are the key things that we need to do. I think that that's something, and I think that would be beneficial to the whole island to do that at this point. Very quickly, Councillor Fuller and then Councillor Stevens, because we are uh, discussing the work programme. So I want to want to move on. Cat, Councillor Fuller. Thank you, Chairman. Good, congratulations. Um, one of the things that I've got coming up with Councillor Drew as the Chairman of the Planning Committee is the Planning Services Improvement Steering Group. Again, it's about putting that meat on the bone. And again, a lot of the things that we, we were looking at this time last year uh, or just beyond it, the within the peer review, it's about getting the affordable housing right. It's a priority, I know, for the whole of the council to make sure we can, can create houses that people can actually afford on the island. It is, it is important, and I'm hoping through planning that we can also help to facilitate the development of um, social housing, affordable housing in the future. I think that is something that we all we all support. Yeah. Councillor Stevens, so briefly. Briefly. People mention affordable housing. I'm talking island affordable because it's all right building houses and uh, having them as affordable. Island people cannot afford uh, the rents that would be applied uh, because of the margins that uh, developers need. Um, and to include in that the Isle of Wight Council with, a, with the uh, possibility of going for up to 40 million pounds worth of uh, loans. Once again, I've said many a time and I'll repeat it again. Section 151 officer needs to see a return which covers the loan. We're going through stringent budgets and we need to take, be aware of that. Now, whether you set up a group or a committee, be aware of officer time and re resource. Open door. OK, I'll invite you all individually. But what I will say is, let me take the strategic housing manager and get her to come along and present an, an all, uh, all members uh, presentation on housing on the Isle of Wight. And that'll include affordable um, purchase, affordable rental, um, leasing, mobile, you name it, we got it. OK, and we'll, we'll tuck it all together and you can have you can have that and then you can decide 
which direction you wish to take this. Thank you. Anything else for the work programme? Fine, we'll move on. Uh, so new agenda item seven, school place planning. Uh, as members of the committee will be aware, the paper for the uh, proposal to consult over school closures has been withdrawn, but I invite uh, Cabinet Member Councillor Andre to uh, make a statement on that, and then I'll invite comment from the committee. Councillor Andre. Thank you, Chair, and I, I welcome the opportunity to present to, to corporate scrutiny on this. When the school place planning papers were published, it became quickly apparent that there was a lot of misunderstanding and confusion over the recommendations that were actually coming to Cabinet. This is part of a statutory process. So the recommendations that were coming to Cabinet were to consult on the closures. The results of those consultations would then have formed a further paper to come back to Cabinet with, with uh, recommendations. Now, I do recognise fully that there are lessons to be learned in the way that we handled matters in the withdrawal of the paper from this month's Cabinet ag agenda. And I do understand and apologise as to how upsetting this must have been for all concerned, including and especially our young children um, and those who may have been most impacted by the proposals. So I can confirm that any future plans will involve a full programme of consultations with all those involved. But what I'm hoping from tonight's corporate scrutiny is that some recommendations, as I say, those lessons learned, so that some recommendations can come forward that we can then embed within any plans moving forward. Would it be helpful, Chair? I know that you have been um, supplied with a response to the questions, the public questions that have come into corporate scrutiny. Would it be helpful if I actually read out from that statement? Um, I, I'm happy for you to do so. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. So um, this is the response to public questions received for the meeting of Corporate Scrutiny Committee to be held on the 6th of June 2023. So we thank everyone for their recent questions submitted to the Corporate Scrutiny Committee about the primary school place planning paper that was due to be discussed at the Isle of Wight Cabinet on the Thursday, the 8th of June, 2023. The Isle of Wight's Children's Services Management team were asked to draft this paper following a discussion on forecast pupil numbers at the September 2022 Policy and Scrutiny Committee for children's services, education and skills. It is important to note that the questions that we've received that have been submitted are exactly the type of queries that we would have been seeking during the consultation had the decision been made on the 8th of June for consultations to begin. And I will stress the decision that was going to Cabinet was for prior consultations no school closures at that point. After the, uh, the consultation, the views of all those contributing to the debate would have been shared with Cabinet and fully considered before any final proposals were made for further consultation. And as per the statutory due process, a further paper would have come back to Cabinet. Should Cabinet decide to undertake these consultations in future, I would urge all contributors, in fact, I would urge all members of the public, members, anyone with queries such as these to engage with those consultations at that time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to the committee and I know Councillor Downer has already emailed me to say that he would like to um, make comments on this. I'll just read 
These might be quite pithy comments, but I do believe that they are justified, uh, Councillor Andre, because I have spoken to you about these before. Um, and I would say I feel that this has been handled extremely badly, causing consternation with parents, pupils, staff and the wider community. Firstly, schools should never have been named. That is absolutely awful. And uh, the heads of these schools only found out on, on the Wednesday, the war case was on Thursday, and then it went to press on the Friday. And it went to press early. Uh, to make matters worse, all this took place just on breaking up for half term. It is all very insensitive and seems to me it's all based on statistics and not worrying about people. What about people? Schools have increased costs like everybody with higher fuel costs. Closing schools will increase transport costs. And DEFRA, years ago, stressed the importance of rural communities and schools. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Councillor Love. Yes, I, I must admit I was um, less than impressed with how this information was released. Um, having been in education for 30 years, I was actually quite shocked that Hampshire um, the, the would, would actually agree to release this information in that particular way without doing a consultation first because of the impacts. So I'm, I guess I'm sort of asking is who actually made the decision to uh, to release this information in that particular way? I guess it was certainly not professional. Um, and I'm a bit just slightly concerned. I might have heard this wrong. Should Cabinet decide to do this, meaning consultation in the future, um, we always do consultation before we do anything. There's no should. It's must do consultation in these particular uh, issues. Um, it, you know, it has caused a lot of concern with teachers um, and uh, educational systems. And I do welcome the apology. I think that that is important to make, but the mistake should not have been made in the first place, particularly with something of such significance. What matters now is how we move forward and that we do recognise and need to recognise that we have to do something about school places. It's long overdue, it's been highlighted previously that we have too many school places and it is going to be difficult for everybody, both the teachers, the schools and the cabinets and us in having to make really difficult decisions about closing schools. But we will have to do that. And I think that's a really important thing to state now. There is no debate about it. We cannot wait any longer. We have to get on and we have to do it. But I would hope that the plan would be made properly and looking longitudinally, that's a good way of saying, um, so that we don't have to revisit closures of schools in the next 18 months. So let's look at where we are now. Let's forecast on the birth rates that we've got and let's have a plan moving forward of at least five years. That would be my suggestion. I mean, presumably it's not a contentious point that this was put on the cabinet agenda with the consent of, well, you, Councillor Andre, and presumably the leader. If I can just come back on something, I, I thank Councillor Love for his comments. But if I could just come back on something that he said, should consultation, I think I think a little bit of clarity, because um, I think that's slightly out of context. I must stress that this is part of a statutory process. So consultation is not optional. It's should, by listening to hopefully some recommendations coming forward tonight from corporate scrutiny and other, other um, relevant parties, well, everyone's a relevant party, but all, all further comments coming forward, should we come back with this? And you quite rightly said, Councillor Love, we do need to make very difficult decisions here. We are willing to make those decisions, but I do recognise it needs to be done in the right way. So, as I say, I look forward to those recommendations, but thank you. Councillor Love and then Councillor Ellis. Thank you. I appreciate what you've said. The bit that disturbs me about this is that Hampshire is giving us lots of advice and lots of support and therefore I'm really surprised that Hampshire would have agreed to put out a statement in that way unless of course we were badly advised and I'm just trying to understand that little bit of what has or hasn't happened. 
Thank you, Chair. I appreciate you letting me come back in. I'm just a little bit unclear as to, can we just be clear which statement you're referring to? Are you referring to, to the, the statement on the withdrawal of the paper or are you referring to the when the paper itself was published? Well, this paper shouldn't have been published in the way that it has or been advertised in the way that it has to the press. That's the point. I mean, I think the point that's being made, yes, it's a formal consultation and that was only ever the proposal, but I think the point Councillor Love's making, it's certainly a point I would make, that, uh, put it this way, there hadn't been sufficient communication to prepare people for this paper to come out, particularly those schools and the parents involved, because I imagine it's quite a lot to get your head round when you thought the school you sent your children to was a very good school, and, and, and they are, uh, and that there was no suggestion they were closed to then suddenly see their name in a proposal for consultation about closure. I think that could have been handled better. Thank you, Chair. That's very helpful. Thank you. I will take that on board. Councillor Ellis. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Andre, for your explanation, your apologies this evening. And thank you to Councillor Love for bringing up the fact that, unfortunately, surplus places in primary schools is a national issue. It's one that we're facing, you know, along with a lot of other authorities on the mainland. Um, I um, was concerned about the way that it was handled. Um, I'm concerned that possibly Again, there's an issue with the press. The press really seemed to sort of have the information very, very quickly. I mean, I saw the email at six o'clock, three minutes past six, I think I saw it, but it was on it was on, on the white 13 minutes later, and then it was on the front page of the Observer, which was very concerning because they must have had it the night before in order to have done that. However, what I wanted to come point I want to come to is you're asking Councillor Andre, I if I've understood you correctly, you're inviting um perhaps ideas of how this could be approached in the future to stop this happening. It, is there a process where we could have a sort of more informal consultation with Hampshire, with head teachers, with governors, with you know members that know their communities, the people that know these schools on the island? Because I completely understand on paper why those four schools were chosen. Just look at the statistics, the cold hard facts. Yes, you might choose them. But if you know the island, you know the schools, you maybe would pick a different school. Thank you. If I may, you make some very good points, Councillor Ellis, but just for some form of reassurance, there were a lot of consultations going on with head teachers. Um, I would refer you to the appendix on the paper where. Um, it would the head teachers executive together with the chair of the chairs of governors of the island actually attended a children's um, services corporate scrutiny, sorry, children's services scrutiny to actually put their recommendations forward. So there have, I, I wouldn't want you to think that there have not been ongoing conversations. What I do take on board is that what and what you've alluded to is the the way that the public were informed of this. So I will very much take that on board. But I wouldn't want you to think that there were no conversations going on behind you know behind the scenes because there were. Councillor Lever. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I, I, I guess it kind of falls on from what Councillor Ellis and Councillor Lover spoke about. And it's not even necessarily to uh, Councillor Andre this this particular point I, I think I guess it's just more of a concern and a plea to I don't know national government to Hampshire because regardless of the schools that were named in the in the paper um, as concerned as that will be for those specific schools I think that the broader issue here for me and the, the long-term vision is that we're, we're talking about school closures anyway regardless of what the schools are and and what that means long term because essentially what we were talking about Year on year, we're talking about managed decline, right? Because school numbers are going down. The the problem is, or, or the perceived problem is, that low school numbers means school closures. But I think the problem there is it, that isn't the the real problem. The real problem is bad funding models, right? Which means that low numbers equal school closures. So, um, <laughs> I guess my point is just to express concern that we we're going to keep having these conversations year on year unless those things change. 
Um, so I'd, ju I'd just like to see a, 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 a plan, a clear plan going forward from Hampshire um, about a, how we're going to turn that ship around, essentially, because basically it's, it will mean the closure of our rural schools if nothing changes. Yeah, thank you. I think look, looking ahead, uh, if a paper of this nature were to come forward again, uh, I would like to see a little bit more objective detail as to how the schools were shortlisted. I think reading some of the reasoning, it makes sense. Uh, give the example, give an example of uh, it takes into account uh, planning applications and likely development. Uh, to use the example of the Rye Primary School that was in this document, I mean, it's a mile away from the West Acre development, uh, and I should think two miles away from Penny Feathers. You know, the, the evidence base didn't seem to lead to an obvious conclusion as to why that school was shortlisted. So I think if this committee were to be looking at a similar paper again, certainly for me, I'd like to see more rigorous evidence of how those schools were shortlisted over other uh, potential schools, if that's achievable. Uh, Councillor Downer. Oh, thank you, Chairman. And I do apologise. I'll try not to be so belligerent this time. <laughs> Um, yes, just one concern, though, uh, Chairman, is that, uh, and Councillor Andre, um, to my mind, I think damage has already been done because of the panic that's put into the parents and also the schools. So they're going to be looking to move their children, aren't they? So it'll do damage to those schools already. Thank you. Councillor Andre. Thank you for that, Councillor Denner, and I think you're, you're perfectly right, but what would be helpful, and I refer back to, to what I said earlier, that I think there has been a lot of misunderstanding here, and that's where recommendations from this committee as to how to engage better with the public, I think will help to mitigate somewhat some of those concerns. So I think in, in terms of recommendations, I think what you've had so far is a recommendation over communication pre pre papers going out, pre going public. I think from me and unless the committee disagree, uh, a slightly more rigorous evidence base as to why those schools have been shortlisted for consultation. Is there anything else in terms of looking ahead? Should a paper ever come back? What, what would we like to see differently this time? Uh, Councillor Quirk and then Councillor Love. Um. In a previous life, I was a member of a local authority planning uh, education committee for 10 years. And uh, one of the 12 years, actually. Uh, but the, one of the things that uh, was apparent is that there are different ways of doing things. And if you've got excess places, uh, yes, you can close schools, but sometimes you can trust schools and there are other options of ways to, uh, to save the, the expenditure. And I think that any paper should actually explain why the option that you have chosen to go along is the right one and why you have dismissed other ones if you have dismissed them. And if you haven't dismissed them, you haven't considered them, um, they should be there and being considered. So I, I do think that there are um, a broader approach about a sort of a, a, a wider thought as to what is happening and what we need to do. And going back from the objective which is reducing school base numbers and reducing the costs, but not necessarily uh, doing it through school closures, particularly if you, you've got a, for a few years ahead, you know what the school numbers are doing. Uh, in the previous authority I was in, we um, we closed or we didn't close the schools, which was very fortunate because you could see the upturn coming in in population. Uh, schools of uh, secondary school of uh, Four forms of entry. Uh, ten years later, at ten forms of entry. Councillor Love. Thank you. I mean, clearly this is going to rumble on now for some time to come until we see some kind of conclusion. Um, I think what might be helpful is to actually get the officers from Hampshire in to talk to us, so that they bring bring the bring the rationale to the table. Um, now, I'm not quite sure that this is the right place for that or not, but certainly if we were to bring the officers in, they're not here today that I can see, um, then 
we would have a better understanding because it is going to be very complex and it is our job um, to help people understand what that means in the simplest of language um, because clearly we're you know I think the shock has occurred it's now what we do next and what we need to do is have a managed approach we've already discussed so I would be wanting to suggest and I'll take your advice on this that actually the officers come to our next meeting and explain the rationale clearly and precisely in a in a very clear way about what their advice is and how they've arrived at that particular formula but more importantly what the options are if this is not the way forward because we're only talking about one method at the moment aren't we potentially forgive me if we've missed something in the middle but but are there any other options on mm. the table? Are there any other combinations of school closures, um, amalgamations, etc.? I'm sure the member is taking all of that into account, but we don't know that, do we? And that's what we need to communicate. So my recommendation would be that we get the officers in and that we look at this and other alternatives if they are possible. Uh, I have no issue with that. I suspect the correct place for that is children's services scrutiny councillor quigley you're the chair uh, indeed, of that committee. indeed it is and um, indeed we do get such information i think and what i will be pulling up is the actual process i don't think anyone could disagree with the heartfelt plea a year ago from teachers and heads of governors but the process and the timing seems to have been a bit awry so that'll be our first port of call but yes it'll come to children's scrutiny and feel free to come along carl thank you um before we move on, is there anything else anyone would like to say on this committee in terms of recommendations to Councillor Andre, or do we feel it's been covered? Fine. OK, we'll move on. Thank you, Councillor Andre. Um, item, what was item seven? Uh, partnership arrangements, pages 31 to 60. Uh, this is this item deals with uh, the council, a report on the council's approach to its partnership arrangements. Uh, we have got a summary document and then we have got a draft partnership framework uh, at page 37. And then finally, we have got effectively a partnerships register um, starting at page. Uh, something like 51 page 51 um i've read it and and have have some comments but i'd like to open it up to the committee uh, are there any comments about that document about the approach or indeed about the draft register Can councillor quigley uh, thank you it's a very good in-depth report as ever now concerns is if you look in the next to the last column on the right hand side there are expected outcomes being delivered every single one says yes with the exception of one which is the children's trust which says our expected outcomes being delivered no so uh, they're all seem very honest my question is is if you look at solar, and tra solar transport uh, the purpose develop policy liaise with government seek funding and deliver projects and systems to support the improvement of transport across the Solent sub-region are expected outcomes being delivered the answer is yes now, I'm sure if we took this to anyone in the high street, anywhere on the island, you said that, do you think outcomes are believed and say no? Now, this isn't a criticism, anything that's being achieved. My issue I want to highlight is I do worry that we're forcing the delivery of good news when we ask for these reports, is we're only getting the things that are being met. We're not actually asking for the roadmap to success. And I think going back to a point Councillor Stevens made is it's all well and good for us to sit and have a good go and tear into the cabinet member, which should happen uh, from time to time. But my concern is we're overloading officers and we get a good news message, which the depth behind it isn't going to be good news. Now, it probably doesn't need much more discussion because I know the chief executive is started on with a uh, reorganisation focused on outcomes and the like. But I guess my recommendation is, is that when we ask for these reports, I'm not really interested in the yeses. I want to see where the noes are because we all know everything isn't perfect on our island. That, that's basically the point. Of Thank you. And I'll, I'll bring in Councillor Bacon in a moment just to add to, I think, one of those you identified, Councillor Quigley, the Isle of Wight Transport Infrastructure Board. It says the expected outcomes are being delivered, but 
but it also says there's no formal system for examining the performance and value for money. There's no partnership agreement. It's an informal partnership. I'm not even sure what that means. Uh, and anyway, there's a period of review. The chairman's undertaking a review with no date as to when that review is uh, expected. That's just, just one example. Councillor Bacon, I should have probably brought you in at the beginning. Well, thank you, Councillor Robertson. Yes, um, my name's on this. So I was uh, anticipating being able to, say, able to say a few things in introduction. Um, the first thing I'd, I'd like to actually like to say is uh, to thank Scrutiny for highlighting this area as one they wish to consider. Um, that has prompted a review, a refresh of the Register of Partnerships, which has already been referred to, um, and also uh, prompted and allowed a review of the partnership framework, which you referred to as being part of the papers, um, which has also proved a useful uh, exercise in light of internal reorganisation that is going on. And the aim is now for that refresh or a refresh to take place annually. Um, we, we, in the comments that have been made so far, have almost jumped ahead into scrutiny of the partnerships identified. Um, great, that's what this uh, documentation perhaps is here to help, as far as this committee is concerned, is to here to help happen. Um, so, I'm the, sorry, just before I get into that, the other thing I wanted to say is um, a point I think needs to be mentioned before detailed discussion goes ahead is just to highlight uh, what's in paragraph 2.2, .2, which is just, because it has seemed to cause some confusion in the past, what is a partnership? It does not mean commission services, it does not mean contractual arrangements. And I think that point is perhaps best underlined by looking at the list of um, partnerships that are referred to. Um, those are also things to be scrutinised, but separately and perhaps in a particular way due to the nature of those relationships. So coming to really the point I perhaps wanted to say before questions started is that the request from scrutiny and the review has uh, created, I hope, a baseline. And that means that through whatever scrutiny process examination is deemed appropriate, um, councillors can look to evaluate each partnership and perhaps uh, following from what uh, Councillor Quigley says, uh, review and assess why there is a yes, why there is a no, um, and whether the view is that that is an appropriate uh, word to use in each case. Um, so that is the process to come. The only other thing I would say is, of course, um, bearing in mind that this was coming before scrutiny, the partnership um, framework agreement, uh, sorry, framework is still draft. We've kept it in draft. And perhaps before getting into the detail of individual partnerships, um, I would invite members, uh, if they wish, to make any comments on the actual uh, framework itself, which may then feed into the more detailed scrutiny to follow. But it's here presented as a draft um, to welcome any such comments, and then the, uh, the detail can follow that when looking at each individual partnership. Thank you for that opportunity. Yes, thank you. So, so yeah, focusing on the framework itself rather than the partnerships in the in the um, spreadsheet. I mean, I've got I've got some some comments maybe to to start us off. Um, I think I think it's good. I think it it's readable and understandable. I think in parts there's possibly some lack of precision. I'm fairly surprised that all these partnerships don't have some form of written agreement. Um, I mean, they're quite important. I mean you know, from, from in terms of council's business. Um, and towards the end of the framework document, just before Appendix 1, I think it says legal services can provide any necessary advice. And then in the appendix, legal services should be contacted for advice in relation to all legal issues. I mean, I thought they've all got some legal issues, but uh, to have no written agreement, if we then go on to Appendix 2, there's a the partnership registration form I and mean, I can't actually see a question. So that, that's the form to fill out in order to put that partnership onto the spreadsheet. I think that's the purpose of it. I mean, there's nothing here that actually says, is there a written agreement? There's a question that says, is there a formal framework for entering the partnership? 
I mean, that's a slightly vague question. I think I prefer, is there a written agreement that governs this? And then the next question, is the purpose and expected outcomes outlined and fully understood? I don't really see how that can be yes, unless there's a written agreement. How can you say the parties to this partnership uh, understand the purpose and outcome when it hasn't been written down because people move on? Maybe I've misunderstood what a partnership is, but for them to merely exist in people's email inboxes or word of mouth only, I, I do slightly struggle with. I don't know whether any comment can be made to that. I, I was hoping someone off on the committee, but Cat Councillor Quigley, your hand is up. Just following on that point, it, I suppose the acid test is if you answer these questions in the negative, is is the person expected outcome outlined and fully understood and you put no in there? What then happens to this application form? Yeah, I don't want that. To, that's a very good question to add to my questions. I don't want, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think these are quite detailed technical matters. So I, I, I have uh, Debbie Downer, who is the officer who's uh, done all the hard work on this one. It may be uh, more appropriate with those sort of questions for her to contribute at this stage. Is that okay, Chair? Please, thank you. Thank you. Um, just, I think, to reiterate what Councillor Bacon said earlier, what, what this review helpfully did was to highlight some of the areas that in the previous reorganisation the whole team had gone. Um, so what we're doing now is picking up some of the gaps that have appeared over that period of time. Um, the process that we've brought is intentionally draft, so we'll thank you for the comments that you've made and we'll take those on board. The system is, is currently hasn't yet been tested because it's still draft, so it will be a continuous improvement process around what we do around these policies and procedures. I think all the points that you've made are well made and will be taken and noted as part of that policy update. And I, I think also, if I, if I may, one, one thing perhaps also to remember is that, of course, the, the council is not the lead party in many of these partnerships. I, mean, I could take two obvious examples, just from the last page, both bodies I've been involved in in the past, the, the SLEP and, and the AONB. Um, they are established elsewise and the council has a seat, has representation upon them, but not the control, a, a contribution, yes, but not control over how they established how they run themselves. We are merely part of that partnership rather than the lead body of it. So that that does apply in a number of situations. Yeah, I, I, I just find it surprising and it may be how it is that there is no, in some instances, nothing apparently in writing. Um, or I think that applied to those two, I must say. Yeah. Um, and, and a couple of other, other points to make, I think sort of reasonably detailed. Um, the final column on the spreadsheet on the register is type of partnership. Some of those say informal partnership. I can't see anything else on the paperwork which really defines what an informal partnership is, or indeed how that column would ever be populated because it's not on the registration form. You know, is this an informal partnership or what type of partnership? Um, and also uh, relating to the leader of the council's role, I mean, I think she's responsible for strategic partnerships. There's nothing on this spreadsheet that sets out whether a partnership is strategic or not. Are they all strategic? Are some of them strategic? It it might be useful to have a column to distinguish them because I think Councillor Bacon, you you're responsible for them if they're not and the council leader is responsible for them if there are if they are. So to have that distinction I think would be helpful. Uh, Councillor Garrett, your hand is up online. Uh, please feel, feel free to speak. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair, and, and um, my welcome to you in the chair that I once sat in. Um, so uh, speaking as chair of the Audit and Governance Committee, um, in some of your remarks, chairs, you, you said stuff which clearly relates to, to kind of governance matters. So if there are any matters that you and, and the committee wish to refer to Audit and Governance Committee, that would be very welcome for us to look at. I'm particularly interested in the um, issues around value for money, again, within the terms of reference of, of the committee I chair. So again, if you've got thoughts that you think that audit and governance should look at some of this as well, that would be, uh, and want to make a recommendation to us in that, that sense, that would almost certainly be welcome. Um, because um, it's difficult to see how value for money is delivered given what's set out in the appendix too. Um, and I have in mind also um, the word risk only 
appears once in Appendix 2. And now it doesn't have to be overwhelmingly in, in a document like that, but, but all of our partnerships will have some, some relationship to uh, the risk profile of, of, the, of the council. So again, if, if your committee in its deliberations thinks there's something that audit and governments can do, um, do let me know. We've got a meeting in July and I can place it on, on, on the agenda for that meeting. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Gower. That's very helpful. I think um, for you to have that uh, as an agenda item on your July meeting would, would be very helpful and, and perhaps you can incorporate some of our comments that you feel are perhaps more, more proper for your own committee um, to discuss them there and hopefully uh, endorse or, or build on those. Um, Councillor Lieber. Thank you, Chair. And I was going to make a similar point to I think what you yourself was making earlier was the around the um, the types of agreement. So um, whether it's a legally binding document or a, a, a statement of intent, a, a understanding or protocol, I guess from my personal opinion, it would be good to understand uh, what the council's interpretation or, or meaning of each one of those types of agreement is and why uh, that type of agreement is is we believe is suitable for the partnerships that we've got in place um and and then i, I guess just out of interest I, i'm I, I assume part of this review may have prompted that uh some of the agreements we do have in place actually re would benefit from a more formal agreement than what we've currently got in place at the moment i'm not expecting to tell me which ones right now but um yeah I suppose the point being that that level of scrutiny follow, follows on from this. Now we've got a process in place or coming into place that will allow the scrutiny of the individual partnerships to take place more efficiently. Absolutely. This is all useful stuff. So we're listening closely to it. Um, again, I, I think I need to make the point that some of these partnerships, we are partners, but we're not the partner, the, the body that defines how it is to operate. Um, and uh, Chairman, you, you have mentioned uh, informal partnerships. What does that mean? Well, um, if I take an example, you, you've almost set up one yourself this evening when talking about a body to look at affordable housing. If you're bringing in other parties into that, it's not statutory based. There's not a specific requirement to do it, but you're setting up a partnership to discuss and look at something. It's not formal, therefore it's an informal partnership. That's sometimes how these things can arise. But I, I think we've, um, Hopefully this has given uh, not just this committee, but also audit uh, and other uh, scrutiny committees a starting point, a list, and where there is interest, concern, uh, or interest or concern, then then the process of scrutiny and examination can start. And, and to say if, if that this exercise has served that purpose, I think it's uh, it's what we. I assume that's what the. Uh, uh, corporate scrutiny body when it's asked for this uh, set out to achieve. Are there any other comments from the committee? No. OK, well, thank you very much indeed. It's uh, it's a very uh, good um, draft and subjects and scrutiny and amendments and audit committee uh, look forward to being able to scrutinize some of the actual partnerships in the future. Thank you. Um, on to item eight, which is the Quarterly performance monitoring report, pages 61 to 128. Uh, so this is the quarterly report that we get uh, in front of this committee, obviously four times a year. Um, it's there in detail. I think uh, this is possibly the first time that we've had a, a sort of summary, summary paper covering it, which I think is very useful. It draws out the uh, more remarkable uh, uh, trends or differences or changes. And I think that, that's that's a very good thing. I think it makes it a lot more uh, readable. So thank you for that. And, and can we have that uh, for all, all reports in the future? Um, I'm, I'm not going to invite cabinet members to, to, to go through um, the reports in relation to their own cabinet uh, briefs because I think they, they speak for themselves. Is there anything any cabinet member wanted to sort of add to what their their own report says? And if not, I'll go straight over to the committee. No, fine. OK, um, is there any. Anything of comment or note or scrutiny that a member of the committee wanted to raise? Councillor Quigley. 
Sorry, uh, first out of the locks again. Um, yeah, the summary report is great. The exception reporting that we, we've been asking for for a long time. Thank you very, very much for that. Uh, page, what we like, 69, reducing debt and interest payments. Now, this is an area I don't think even as councillors we get enough information on. The average person they look at, they're going to go, well, that's good. Well, well first of all, they'll be scared by the fact that the, the council borrows 198.2 million. They shouldn't be because councils and money work very different to households. Um, but the reduction needs some explanation because in theory, we think that was a good thing. But when we take into account we lend money to other councils at the same time as borrowing money, people will ask, well, why are we doing that when we're not building houses or whatever else? So I think that in itself is worthy of a lot more explanation. And I think that's worthy of a, a, of a 20 minutes at corporate scrutiny at some stage. But I think a point to draw our attention to, if any of you are, are like me and dealing with people from all over the island, not just in my constituency, page 87, those are the figures that should put a chill into all of us because page 87, average number of people on the housing register per month in each of the bands, and I know the bands represent different things, is stubbornly sticky. And this goes back to Councillor Drew's point. Uh, and, and I know Councillor Stephen spends every waking moment worrying about this, as do I is that in the last two weeks I've had three people who are just about to become homeless. One person resigned themselves to it by just surviving with enough clothes to get day to day and one plate and one cup each for her and, aut each for her and her autistic son and said, well, as soon as they kick me out, the council will have to do something because they won't do anything until then, is that we can't keep having this conversation. And I know I don't want to drag this out because I know it isn't for now. This is for us to do something about, but we're not, nothing is shifting and something is sticking. As Councillor Drew says, and the thing that's sticking is finance. And the one thing that I know we will all argue about in, in the main chamber, in here we are going to have to work together and we're going to have to do something about housing because this is, get, this is becoming beyond untenable. Now, we've probably all had a few emails from people saying, don't tax my second home, I think it's unfair. I will put my marker out there mm -hmm. and they're the ones I don't respond to, if I'm perfectly honest, but I will spend all of my time dealing with the residents mm -hmm. who are going to end up on the streets. So really what I'm saying is this committee really needs to do everything we can as a committee, non-politically in here, to start getting this number down and getting rid of whatever glue it is that's sticking it where it is. Everything else I'm quite fine with. Thank you, Councillor Quigley. I, I, I don't know whether you were making a point those two things are related, but they seem to me related. We, we're somehow managing to reduce council debt, but not spending money on, on uh, sorting out the housing crisis. I think in terms of the bandings for me, very good to see band one, the most acute band has come down and uh, significantly as a percentage. But that's not to say bands two, three and four aren't all people with some fairly severe needs. I mean, band two, severe overcrowding. Band three is multiples of band four, homeless applicants, significant medical welfare issues, hazardous property conditions. With possible exception of band five, those sound like all people with fairly severe needs to me, as described. Um, Councillor Adams. Uh, as I'm sitting here substituting, but Councillor Spink, who's the vice chair, has asked, asked me to ask some questions on his behalf. And this is relevant to what we're talking about now. So the questions to yourself, Ian, was, uh, it's been set up recent planning committee meetings. There's a basic human right to have a roof over a head. He agrees with that. And he's surprised to see that the bans on pages 87 and 88, only ban four refers to homeless applicants. Peter's questions are, how many on band one of the homeless register do not have a roof over their heads? Similarly, how many on each of bands two, three and four do not have roofs over their heads? How many on each of the bands are in temporary accommodation? And what is the housing register definition of temporary accommodation? And in the last two years of the Alliance administration, how many people on the housing register have been rehoused and removed from the register? How many are proposed to be removed within the next two years? Councillor Stevens. Thank you, Chair. I want a lot of detail there, and to be quite candid, I'm not going to fire into the into the air. If I can have a copy of the questions, then you will get a full response. And I think that's the best way to do it. I don't, and I know, I know, and as Councillor Quigley said. I have sleepless nights on this. I've had it for two years, if not more, because it affects all of us across the chamber. And my words sometimes sound as though, yeah, we've heard it all before. 
but every number that's that's in those statistics, whether it be band one to five, are needed and required. The last thing that people want is to tap on the door of the of the Isle of Wight Council. So, uh, Councillor Adams, yeah, please give me the information. I'll take it away and I'll give you and uh, indeed other members of the committee, uh, including uh, Councillor Spink, a uh, full response. I mean, Councillor Stevens, thank you. I think the question keeps coming back to you because you are in the executive position, you're in the cabinet position and have been for two years. And, and these numbers seem, as Councillor Quigley said, sticky. You know, they, they are not reducing. Bef before I come back, is there anything Councillor Adams would like to? I'd like to ask a supplementary. Has, have we got any plans to introduce any modular housing? At this moment in time, no, no, we haven't. But we don't rule those out. Everything's everything's on the table, but at this moment in time, um, we're working on um, various other um, proposals. And I've I've got a sheet here that I'm going to share with with the members that do meet with me informally with regards to um, housing. Those that have not the door and shown an interest. Um, and I'll, and if we can get a meeting such as I proposed with uh, strategic manager of housing, um, uh, then everyone will be invited everyone will get the information and everyone be, will be enlightened what i will say about uh, whilst i've got the microphone what i will say is that this is not an easy fix in our in the position that we've got with budget pressures now i've got a section 151 officer who expects if not a, a return he expects every transaction to wash its face and not cost this authority a penny. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I've got a hand up from Councillor Quirk and then Councillor Love. Uh, on page 68, we have the value of cumulative capital expenditure compared to profile budget and with the aim that capital expenditure is with, within or under budget. Uh, actually, capital expenditure drives a lot of things, including sort of things like housing. And it's important that it actually is spent. And yeah, you don't want to go over budget, but you don't want to be significantly under budget. And I think, you know, if that expenditure, we should see it as a failure. It'd be more than a couple of percentage points under budget, as well as being over budget. Uh, Councillor Love. Sorry, apologies, we've got that many pages of different stuff. I normally put markers in and I haven't. So, I mean, for me, there, there are three things from the quarter returns. One is poverty. The second is housing, which I think we've done. We've had quite a lot to say about tonight. But the third is individual debt. So we talk about council debt, but I'm actually thinking about the impact from poverty on personal debt of individuals. And many of those people tend to perhaps because it's an assumption that I make, um, be in not great accommodation. So I do agree um, with Councillor Adams that actually the need is rented accommodation by far, and that's what we need to do in order to move people from um, the waiting lists into good, good properties. But I'd like to see some more detail around the debt and what we're actually doing to be able to support people who are in debt and what impact that is having for this council because i'd like to see whether if that's impacting upon our own finances because if that is then that's an issue that also manifests moving down the line and i think we need to understand that and we need to actually put in there some support mechanisms so you know by getting better housing we reduce poverty because it raises it raises people's ability to be able to to care for themselves, work for themselves, live in better conditions. Um, but the debt worries me significantly at the moment in terms of these reports, um, because there are some references in here. I'm sorry, I, I did have the page um, to debt, but what kind of concerns me is when we talked about poverty within the document, you know, uh, one of the recommendations is we're working on uh, developing a um, a registry of organisations to support people. Actually, what we need to be doing is, is 
working on recommendations of how to lift people out of poverty. You know, that's just one strand. I'd like to see a lot more effort going into the, um, the prevention. Thank you, C Councillor Quigley. Uh, yes, sorry, uh, page 105 sent it. So you've got a comp uh, comparison between number of major planning applications received and then percentage of all planning applications processed within agreed timescales. Uh, we're looking at 65% and that's been again trending down. Now that is a in pro statistical terms, process terms, that's something that is outside of capability. So no matter what we shout about, we're not going to be able to get that back to 100%. So we need to do something to help planning get back within capability. Otherwise, we're just going to make that problem worse and worse. Now, I don't know what that is. I think there's probably worth looking at fees that are charged because I have no doubt that some of the activity the planning department undertake is currently done at a loss because they might have uh, uh, information required to do it. But that, that's not going to shift anyway unless we do something about it, I don't think. I keep getting the urge to agree with what you're saying, Councillor Quigley. Uh, that's <laughs> it does something odd to you being in that chair, I'm telling you. Uh, yeah, I mean, those statistics are fairly sticky, aren't they? The, the 65%, 68%, 70%, they've been around there for a while. And I think it would be good to see how we can get those numbers at least going in the right direction. Councillor Fuller. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, one of the issues that the LPA has had is since the lockdown, there has been a lot of planning applications that have sort of like increased. Um, nationally, the same has happened. I think on the island, our planning applications still continue to increase when the rest of the country was plateauing. That has meant a lot of work um, placed upon our planning officers. What we have found recently, though, is that the planning applications are starting to plateau. Um, a lot of the, the officers that I have in my planning team are actually getting on and catching up with a lot of the, the backlogs that there are. I'm not saying that it, it is we're out of the woods yet, but um, applications are being dealt with. Planning enforcement is being dealt with a lot quicker and we need to we need to make sure that that ment momentum continues. So, yes, um, I get a lot of calls from people saying to me, I put put in this application months ago. Why why hasn't it been processed? That's not acceptable. But we need to we need to address that. Um, the planning department are aware that this needs to be addressed, and we're doing all that we can with the resources that we can. Because one of the other issues that we have is staff resources are not easy to come by within planning, as Carl will know. With within children's services, it's a lot um, more lot lucrative for planning officers to work on a mainland authority and a lot more lucrative to work in as agency staff. And that takes that takes the bums off seats in, in at sea close. So we are we are fighting with with outside pressures as well. But again, I would concur that that figure is not acceptable and we're looking to improve that and turn that around. Um, thank you, Councillor Fuller. I think if 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 COVID is uh, a reason, uh, I think we would probably conclude that it can't be a reason for much longer. And in fact, if there's simply a new reality post COVID, uh, then we need to make some adjustments to that new reality. But if it is just a lag time on COVID, then I think we've got to see those figures improving from, from now on. Yeah, can I, can, Councillor Quigley? Um, thank you, Councillor Fuller. What I don't want you to do is try and give us good news when I know the department needs help. And I'm not, uh, please don't take this as an attack on you with the department, it's the opposite. What I'm saying is they are now overwhelmed lacking in resources lacking in finance if we don't what you outlined there was the beginnings of an action plan if we know for instance if i went and said to ollie bolter is there activity in this department that you know costs costs more than you charge for it he'd say yes rich sit down and i'll take you through it we as corporate scrutiny can say well maybe we look at the fees and charges for planning also plan applications from what we've said tonight about building houses for people to live in are going to go up so what I don't want you to do, Paul, is Phil, you've got to come here and tell us good news when there is no good news for a good, good while on that yet. Come to us and say, help me with this action plan, because we will. That's what we're here for. Okay, Councillor Fuller. Just to draw it to your attention, but there has been a government consultation on planning fees. Um, government has been consulting with local authorities about um, you know, increasing the fees. Again, what tends to happen and what has happened nationally 
is that fees have been held at the same level for a good many years. The government is now looking at increasing housing fees and actually index linking planning fees as well. Um, but, you know, I, I think um, we, we're not, we're, we're, you know, there is always the aim to try to make sure that we wash our face in, in the planning department, but we're, we're, we're not there. And I don't think there are very many planning authorities anywhere in the country that actually goes beyond washing their face. Uh, Chief Executive. Thank you. And, it, and it's just a point of, of clarification, really, Chair, um, and, and to provide some context that planning fees, planning application fees are set nationally by regulation. So of ourselves, we have no ability to change those fees. As Councillor Fuller alluded to, there has been a recent consultation by government. Um, I think every local authority in the country is kind of waiting to see what the outcome of that is in terms of any discretionary um, opportunity there is to then look at full cost recovery for planning application fees. Um, so it, it is work in progress, but we are tied by a, a government timetable. Uh, Councillor Love. Yes, I'm kind of sitting here thinking, is there a new tactic that we can take within the, within the field of building? The, the point is, is, is that we approve lots of applications and then properties don't get built. And it seems to me that there needs to be some kind of, and I don't know if this is possible or not, but some kind of action which could be financially um, more, uh, impacting to make them, to motivate them to build those properties. So some, you know, three years and, and nothing happens. Um, we need to hold them accountable because in actual fact, we've got that many houses that could be built that have got planning permission and are not being built because they are land banking for one reason or another. And it seems to me that if we could, within our fees, um, have an escalation, if you build within one year, you get X, but if you don't build within three years, then it costs you X in order to motivate people to build those houses sooner rather than later, rather than sitting on it until it's appropriate. That has to happen. I suspect our hands are fairly tied by legislation on that, but I do wonder whether there are not uh, related power, ancillary powers around uh, planning that would genu genuinely incentivize people to, to build, to sure. build houses. I, uh, Councillor Love. I think that's the point that I'm making is, is that there might be national, national guidance and that might be fixed, but what's to stop us from implementing our own local controls on top of that in order to motivate people to build the houses which they apply for? That's the point that I'm making and that's the bit that I think that we should look at. Uh, Councillor Fuller. I'm trying to remember this off the top of my head. Um, I think it's policy G5 within the iron planning strategy. I might be wrong, but I think it's policy G5 within the planning strategy. But again, what we're looking at is preventing exactly that. After three years, the timetable starts all over again. A lot of the time we allow planning applications and it's like a revolving door. You can come back after three years and, and come back with, with an application and it may be approved. Now, in, in fairness, the planning officers are aware of this. This is why it's been incorporated within the island planning strategy under policy G5, I think. Um, but the NPPF are also looking at doing, replicating that policy within future legislation. We're just waiting for that legislation to come about. I think we're all waiting for that legislation that was coming about. It was promised at the end of spring and here we are in the summer. So we're, we're still waiting and hopefully there will be positive things in the NPPF as well as what we can do nationally. If we can get the IPS up and running, that will give our, cunning, our current or future planning committees the opportunity to be able to, to take more action to make sure that when an application is approved, it is done within a, uh, within a timely manner. Uh, is there anything else on the quarterly reporting? Uh, Councillor Quigley. I apologise for taking us where Councillor Spink normally does. I, I should not have mentioned housing. I do apologise. So moving on then to page 111 uh, is uh, average gross weekly wage, which is in the exception report, has dropped, uh, which is exceptional to the area as well. Just a point to raise is that is the whole process behind um, the Community Wealth Building Initiative. And I thank uh, Wendy for, for the way she's putting the reorganisation together because it's very important 
that we rely on internal investment rather than just over the water investment, as it were. And just a congratulations to the team at One Leisure to get in the one cards back up to the pre-pandemic yeah. levels, because that makes a huge difference to uh, the variance on leisure income. And uh, it's there, but they're all very good gyms and very lovely staff. Uh, Councillor Adams. Yeah, while we're on the quarterly monthly reporting, uh, prior to the Alliance declining, Chris Jarman's efforts to remain as a cabinet member on finance. Chris has mentioned about the changes that he's implemented to the financial reporting and that these would provide end, end of month figures by the middle of the following month. A huge improvement over the earlier mechanisms where everything was three months out of date. When will this new end of month reporting be available to corporate scrutiny and other members? Is that something you can deal with, Councillor Bacon? I can't give you an answer off the top of my head, but if the question comes in writing, I'm sure I can. Uh, so I just don't have the information in my head unless the chief executive could possibly assist, but I don't think she can by the look of it. <laughs> Any other comments on the quarterly reporting? Apologise, chief executive. No, I was I was just going to say that um, the the routine performance reporting that comes to corporate scrutiny is on a quarterly basis, so you will always get that quarterly report that comes. Um, now we can we can change reporting if that is what corporate scrutiny want, and they want something on a monthly basis. But I think we would need to provide a written response to that additional ask because of the resource implications that go beyond what we would normally do for monthly reporting to Cabinet. Yeah, I think I mean, from my perspective, I think this is uh, this reporting is 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 very helpful and it's very visual uh, and with a summary document over the top of it. Um, I, I mean, even if you could produce this every month, I don't think that is particularly uh, what this committee is for is to scrutinise this every single month. And I'm not even sure a summary report particularly delivers anything more than we're achieving. I, I understand Councillor Jarman's point, particularly on finance, but I, for myself, I wouldn't be seeking to change the way we do this. Is there anyone else on the committee with a view? Councillor Love. No, I, I think I think the danger is, is that we over report and we spend hours and hours and hours reporting rather than doing. Um, and so actually, I'd say it, it, it's in times of plenty, this is really good, but we're now in times of not plenty. And I think the officers need to be working on other things rather than providing ream upon ream. However, the one thing that is important right now, because it governs everything, is finance. So I think that that is quite important to have that as, as often as we can. But that would have to come, in my view, at a sacrifice of some of, some of this, because it would be quite interesting to discover just how much time goes into all of this reporting um, from, from your perspective. Not, not, not asking that question to be pedantic. I'm hoping it, if, 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 if the response is too much time, then we need to do something which changes that and makes it easier. Yeah, I'd, I'd hope some of this is, if not automated, you know, is pulled from, from reporting tools, even if they're sort of basic tools. I'd hope, I hope this isn't, it's obviously not sort of, fresh pen to paper stuff every time you know i count uh, councillor adams and then councillor quirk if i could just come in again it's i agree with you Cole, but i think there's been things going on which we've not been privy to one of those things is i believe a trial period has been tested within the finance and they've got this down to 17 days so surely and what concerns me with the finances being in such dire condition i believe if we've in receipt of these figures, it can only be helpful. And if Chris has initiated something and got it down to 17 days, if this can be pushed forward, Joe, I think that's important to every councillor that sits in this chamber. I believe we need to be in receipt of those figures, monthly rather than quarterly, if, if we can. I'm very willing to have a conversation after this meeting, the Chief Executive, relevant Cabinet member, and, and you, um, Councillor Adams and Councillor Jarman, to see if there's something that, that the committee might might recommend or suggest as a change? If I may, Chair, I think some of that is the practicalities of um, administering a process. So if the financial, for example, if the financial report 
uh, is available after 17 days. Every scrutiny committee would have to be after the 17th of the month. Scrutiny is earlier in the month because Cabinet is the second Tuesday in every month. So I think first. the first, first Tuesday, a Tuesday early in the month. Um, so I think it's the practicalities of what the ask is and whether or not there's an alternative route through that. But I'm happy to have a conversation with you outside. Fine, thank you. Uh, Councillor Quirk and then Councillor Quigley. Uh, one assumes that the basic information in the, this document, uh, so the graphs and things like that, are produced automatically by macros. If they're not, they should be. Uh, so there's the work in it is actually putting the commentary around it. Uh, and I don't see any reason why members shouldn't get uh, a summary report that doesn't have require a lot of work. It's just artificial intelligence putting a report off and sending it round with the graphs and you can see if something's going you know if you suddenly got a dip in a line or a, a surge in a line you can see that something's happening but I, I, I think quarterly for this of course the report that actually has the um, explanation around it is, is quite adequate but you know, the, it shouldn't require a lot of office of work or time to actually make available uh, just the graphs I, I'm with you, Councillor Robertson, is I don't really see the value in it. There's lots of value. Now, I have faith in the Chief Executive. I have faith in 151 Officer. This is what they do day in, day out. I'm sure they want the information sooner than 17 days if they could, and I'm sure they look at it first thing at one minute past six on the 17th. For 39 councillors to get a summary on a regular basis is just going to increase their workload by 39 times because of the amount of questions that get asked. And I don't, we aren't the management team. We're here to say what we want. They tell us how. What we want is a council that's providing housing, sorting out NHS dentists and the ferries for top three off my head. Uh, we don't need to, to know the rest of it. So I don't think in terms of our time or certainly officers time, there's any value in, in, in us doing that on a regular basis to this committee. Uh, Councillor Adams. I need to come in again because I'm, you know, you've made a very valid point there. And as much as you call me a NIMBY and refer to me as a NIMBY, I would like to see people housed. And I think we, you know, we desperately need to get people out of this temporary accommodation and in proper houses. It's, I have concerns. I believe the latest figure for keeping our health centres open is £100,000 a month. We subsidise them too. I believe, and with the greatest respect, Richard, because I do not want to see these places shut. But I need, I think we need to look at how they're modelled, how they're managed. There's some serious questions to be asked now. And but my concern with that is if that's costing us £100,000 a month, for that £100,000 a month, would it not be better spent rehousing 100,000 families? Yeah, th th thank you, Councillor Adams. I think um, on the finance reporting, we'll have the conversation. Nothing is going to be reported to this committee in addition without this committee's approval, but I think the conversation is one that should be had and we may be able to deliver it another way. I know it's not that straightforward. It, it's just a point I felt I needed to raise because it's something I feel quite strongly about. And don't get me wrong, I don't want to see the leisure centre shut. I don't. But we still have questions around financing and the way things are run. Thank you. Is there anything else on the quarterly reporting? Fine, thank you. Um, final agenda item 10, members question time. Uh, actually, I have one. Well, it's a, it's a question I forgot to put earlier on the partnership uh, arrangement. So it came from uh, Diana Conyers from IWL, who I see is on, on, on screen, dialed in online. Councillor Bacon, it was really about the uh, arrangements between the Isle of Wight Council and some of the town and parish and community councils um, and whether uh, as a comment as much as a question whether any of those would fall into a, uh, a partnership now or in the future and indeed may appear on those you know on those spreadsheets I think it was more uh, sort of food for thought because obviously the relationship between the Isle of Wight Council and town and parish and community councils is evolving all the time uh, and it may be that there are some partnerships there. I think she felt most of them probably come under the definition of other types of arrangements, but um, at least a possibility, if not now in the future, that that's what we'll be doing. 
uh, potentially, um, but I would actually defer to Councillor Fuller as this is a specific relations with town and parish councils are a specific part of his portfolio. And Fine, thank you. Apologies, Councillor Fuller. No worries. It's um, I've been involved with town and parish councils for a couple of years, but it's, it's now been highlighted as as my my um, portfolio as part of my portfolio, which is excellent. Um, one of the things that we are working with, and, and Diana will know this, is that we are looking at working with our town and parish councils to look at where we can strengthen the, um, the relationships with respect to providing public services. We know in the next few years we are going to be providing fewer and fewer public services, but there is an opportunity to work with town and parish councils to find out what the public services are most important to them in their own individual areas. Um, if you go to one parish council, they'll always say one thing, and the parish council say, says another. Um, I'm having a meeting with town parish councils in a couple of weeks' time and um, look forward to hearing from them where their priorities are coming from. And we're hoping to have a workshop later on in the uh, uh, towards the budget setting so town and parish council knows how how things can move forward. Uh, you know, I I had a daft thing that came through to me only this this afternoon about uh, residents and uh, the other side of the island saying, well, you know, the grass cutting is absolutely abysmal in our area. When you look at what we can provide statutorily, um, I think it's um, in, in some respects four, four cuts a year. Now, if a town and parish council wants to do it more often, we should be working with those town and parish councils to make it as easy as we possibly can. It's not just about IWALC. I was talking to Chris earlier on about this. It's about all town and parish councils on the island. We need to, we're, we're, we've made some real headway with our town and parish councils, but I would like to go so much further and see them as our, our friends when it, it comes to providing public services. I think when we started off as an Isle of Wight council um, in 1995, um, um, we were there providing the good stuff, the, the sexy stuff, the stuff people love to do. Now we are looking at now just achieving just our um, statutory services. And that's a real shame. So, again, it's having that conversation and trying to make some headway. And I'd welcome any any member of um, committee to, to work with me to see if we can get at the best best bang for our buck, which is what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not aware of any other member questions. Uh, Councillor Love. Yes, I would just like to just raise a question. Um, so um, having received compensation, um, which I believe is millions, but we don't know, know how much for the floating bridge, I would like to know about the process um, that's been implemented for replacing the floating bridge with the money that we've received um, and with some timelines, please. And if we're not going to use the money to replace the floating bridge, what are we going to use the money on which we've received in compensation? I'd like some timelines against that, please. And I, what the process is. I think those sound like very interesting questions, but possibly ones that we should be provided in writing because they're rather fundamental. Um, I'm quite happy to receive them in writing. Um, I just think that it's important that we actually now move forward from where we were and have a timeline of how we're going to move forward or at least a discussion about it. Um, so that's my question. I'm happy to receive that in writing. Thank you. Um, and I should probably also say that Councillor Lilly has, has asked some questions in relation to the uh, schools consultation. I don't think they ever technically reached. I don't know whether we intended them to technically reach democratic services, so they weren't they weren't formal uh, councillor questions. But I or member questions. I will direct him to send them to you, Councillor Andre, if he wants them asking. I think you've probably been copied in, but I will re ask will ask him to resend them to you. Um, anyone else? No. In which case, thank you very much. That brings the meeting to an end. Well done, Joe.